Let me just say right off the bat that John Carpenter is one of my favorite filmmakers ever. If you don't know who John Carpenter is, here's a quick list of his filmography. He's brought us some of cinema's finest examples of action and suspense, of gruesome and terrifying horror, and of weird romances, and all kinds of cheesy sci-fi goodness. I mean, what would the world be without, without The Thing, without Halloween, without Big Trouble in Little China, Escape from New York, Escape Okay, so John Carpenter's legacy isn't exactly without its blemishes. However, like any great director, even Carpenter's less notable efforts still have something in the way of entertainment to offer. But there is one among them that really holds a special place in my heart, and that's because it combines two of cinema's greatest treasures, vampires and James Woods. John Carpenter's Vampires was not quite the genre-changing vampire western action horror extravaganza Carpenter and team were hoping for, but despite its initial lukewarm reception, John Carpenter's Vampires has got on, like many of his films have, to gain somewhat of a cult following, and I still argue that it's one hell of a good time. As I said, the early 1990s had brought John Carpenter one commercial and critical failure after another. And so the director was looking for a surefire hit, something his fans would rally behind, something with name recognition. I mean, where could they go wrong? Your rules are really beginning to annoy me. Ah! Escape from LA had been in development for over 10 years when Carpenter producers Deborah Hill and Kurt Russell decided the climate was right for their long-awaited Escape from New York sequel, something fans had been clamoring for for years. With a $50 million budget, the film finally saw its wide release on August 9th, 1996, and it was an utter failure. The film ultimately only grossed half of its overall budget and ultimately divided both fans and critics. Carpenter once again found himself with a devastating flop. The weight of the losing streak began to weigh on Carpenter, and the iconic filmmaker began to consider retirement, stating that the whole process had simply stopped being fun. Soon after, however, Largo Entertainment contacted Carpenter about a project that they had been developing for several years called Vampires, with actors Willem Dafoe and Dolph Lundgren having been previously attached. The concept was based on a 1990 book of the same name by the late author John Steakley, telling the story of a vampire hunting commercial enterprise secretly funded by the Catholic Church. The studio sent Carpenter two potential scripts, and after reviewing those scripts and the source material, Carpenter came to the conclusion that he could finally have the opportunity to make a Western. Set in the American Southwest, Carpenter envisioned the film as a Western disguised as a horror movie, crediting the Wild Bunch in the films of Howard Hawks as his main inspirations. Carpenter wrote his own version of the script, deviating heavily from the novel and borrowing various elements from the two initial uh, studio drafts and then ultimately forming his own with many of his own kind of original ideas incorporated into the final script. Carpenter definitely made a point to make his vampires uniquely different than the Bela Lugosi Hollywood stereotype, creating merciless, cold-blooded killers who would much rather eat your face than kiss it. Curiously, co-producer Dan Jacoby, one of the co-writers of the original two scripts, ultimately received sole writing credit on the film. While the production seemed well on its way, the project was struck a blow when the studio decided to cut two-thirds of its budget down to just $20 million, forcing Carpenter and team to scramble to dramatically rework the story. Fortunately, Carpenter's roots in shoestring budget filmmaking helped the production steadily reroute, and before you know it, they were back on course, moving forward with production. For the special makeup effects, Carpenter recruited the award-winning talents of K&B Effects Group, formed by artists Greg Nicotero, Robert Kurtzman, and Howard Berger. K&B Effects had gained notoriety for their memorable work in such films as Scream, Wishmaster, Lord of Illusions, Spawn, and From Dusk Till Dawn. The team used a combination of animatronics and makeup effects to create the film's vampire gore and carnage. In fact, the MPAA objected to the original cuts over the top gore, threatening to give the film the dreaded NC-17 rating. To appease the board, Carpenter and team just simply removed moments from the more gorier effects and then just resubmitted the film to get their R rating. A showdown is about to begin between the soldiers of the day and the army of the night. 
The film opened on October 30th, 1998 in nearly 1,800 theaters with little box office competition standing in its way. John Carpenter's Vampire. Carpenter found himself once again hoping for a hit. The film follows master vampire slayer Jack Crow and his ragtag team of mercenary killers, all secretly funded by the Catholic Church. We find our heroes in a bloody action sequence involving the raid of a dilapidated farmhouse turned vampire nest. Utilizing an arsenal of creative weaponry, including a nifty harpoon, the team empties the house of vampires up until sundown, when they retreat to a nearby seedy motel to have a seedy motel party. While the gang celebrates with drinking and harassing prostitutes, a way to blow off steam, Jack argues, the powerful vampire master Jan Valak awakens, hungry for revenge. Valak ambushes the motel single-handedly, Horror movie rule number one, never be the one to answer the door. Valak brutally kills pretty much everyone, but not before finding the time for some good old fashioned seduction. Jack and his only surviving crew member Montoya make a narrow escape with a prostitute named Katrina who has been infected by Valak. After a gruesome burial of his fallen teammates, Jack rendezvous with his superior, Cardinal Alba, who assigns a young priest, Father Guiteau, to tag along as a representative of the church in his hunt for the Grandmaster Vampire. Something Jack doesn't take too kindly to. Jack and Montoya struggle to control the feverish bloodthirst that consumes Katrina, who bit Montoya during an attempted escape. However, as is the case with all humans turned vampires, she has become physically paired with the one who infected her, Valak. Jack and Kato follow Valak's trail of carnage, suspecting he is on the hunt for an ancient and powerful mythical artifact. Katrina sees Valak awaken with six other master vampires who pillage a remote desert monastery. Valak is revealed to be the world's first vampire, inadvertently created by the Catholic Church during a botched exorcism hundreds of years earlier. Valak is on the hunt for a powerful relic known as the Black Cross of Berzier, which if obtained, will allow him the ability to walk in daylight, making him virtually unstoppable. It is funny to me that in the movie you see him drink someone's blood like an actual vampire like only once in the entire film. The rest of the time he's just lopping off body parts, so it just it just seems a little wasteful. When Valak finally gets his hands on the Black Cross, Jack and team must race against the sunset to defeat Valak before it's too late. Katrina leads them to an abandoned town late in the day where, after a little house cleaning, they find themselves face to face with Valak and the other master vampires. Jack is kidnapped, learning that Cardinal Alba has secretly conspired with Valak, seeking immortality for himself. Katrina succumbs to her vampire urges, once again biting Montoya, and then returning to join forces with Valak. With Jack secured to a wooden cross awaiting ignition, Cardinal Alba prepares to perform the ancient ritual that will award Valak unlimited power. However, Father Guiteau, having remained in hiding during the whole ordeal, shoots Alba before the ritual can be completed, and he and Montoya rescue Jack from a fiery death. With the sun now risen and the ritual unfinished, Valak is forced to retreat back into the shadows, Jack caught on his trail. Jack confronts and kills Valak by driving the Black Cross of Brusier through his chest and exposing him to daylight. With Montoya bitten and Katrina turned, Jack allows the pair to have a head start, but vows to hunt them both down in coming days. He and Gateau gear up and head back inside, plenty more vampires to kill. For the role of Jack Crow, Jack Crow. Carpenter knew he needed somebody with an edge, somebody who looked like they could take down a vampire with his own teeth. And of course, that could have only been one man. Someone to care for, to be there for, I have James Woods. Woods became interested in the project after being approached by Carpenter himself, seeing it as an opportunity to do something different with his career. Despite his reputation for being difficult to work with, Woods and Carpenter had a surprisingly amicable working relationship, with the agreement that Woods would be able to improvise every other take. Carpenter ended up loving Woods' improvisation so much that many of them ended up in the final cut of the film. The late, great Chicago Tribune critic Gene Siskel praised Woods' performance as well, even going as far to suggest he be nominated for an Academy Award. Let me just ask you one thing. After 600 years, how's that dick working? Pretty good? Well, I think that's maybe going a little too far. I do think this is one of the better performances in Woods' career. I mean, it's right up there with the sleazy ex-boyfriend from Casino. I want you to understand that I am looking out for you in this thing, okay? You're gonna get yours back. You're gonna get back first. 
Alec Baldwin was originally cast in the role of Montoya, but had to bow out early on in pre-production, recommending to Carpenter that his brother Daniel Baldwin be considered for the role instead. Carpenter screen-tested Baldwin, being unfamiliar with his work, and thought he was perfect for the role. What works most about Baldwin's performance in the film is his interplay with Woods' character. The pair read as old friends because the actors have genuine on-screen chemistry. After seeing actress Cheryl Lee in David Lynch's original Twin Peaks series, Carpenter offered her the role of Katrina, which Lee jumped at. While I think Lee does an admirable job in the film, I just feel like her character isn't given a whole lot to do outside of hanging out in motel bedrooms and feigning vampirism. I also found her relationship with Montoya at times to be a little... problematic. Tim Guinea gives an excellent performance as father Adam Guiteau and also gives James Wood something to do in between action scenes. I think his character arc is one of the highlights of the film. You see him go from this kind of pushover pawn of the Catholic Church to this badass vampire killer. In fact, Guinea also appeared in another popular vampire movie that same year, New Line Pictures' Blade as Dr. Curtis Webb. Not wanting to cast a name talent, producer Sandy King cast actor Thomas Ian Griffith in the role of the merciless vampire leader Jan Valak, wanting someone powerful in stature, but still with an alluring quality. Griffith is good in the film and is clearly having fun playing evil. That being said, the character of Valak is pretty one note. The late veteran actor Maximilian Schell plays Father Alba, and while he does a fine job in the role, he really isn't given much else to do either. I would have liked to have seen his relationship with Crow develop just a little bit more, which would have made his final betrayal all the more impactful. As is the case with most of his films, John Carpenter also provided the musical score to Vampires, composing a memorable and rousing soundtrack, sealing the film's rock and roll western vibe Carpenter had been striving for. Carpenter's scores are always distinctive and unique to his individual films, giving each of his films their own personality and unique tone. However, there is one portion of the soundtrack that is clearly just Escape from New York. Despite a reduced budget, cinematographer Gary B. Kibb further solidifies the film's western look, taking advantage of the vibrant reds and oranges of southern sunsets and the golden hues of desert daylight. Kibb had first worked with Carpenter on 1987's Prince of Darkness and went on to film seven of the Master of Horrors productions, including They Live, In the Mouth of Madness, and Ghosts of Mars. He also filmed Robocop 3. The film opened in the number one spot at the U.S. box office despite receiving mostly negative reviews. While it barely broke even domestically, the film went on to earn nearly twice its budget back worldwide, ultimately making Vampires the only John Carpenter film from the 1990s to be a success. The film also went on to win three Saturn Awards, for whatever that's worth. Vampires saw releases on both VHS and Bare Bones DVD, and has since gone on to see success on the home video market. In January 2017, a limited edition all-region Blu-ray was released from Powerhouse Films via their Blu-ray label, Indicator, featuring a fun collection of special features alongside an excellent high-definition remaster. 20 years on, and John Carpenter's Vampire still manages to entertain. The film offers an interesting amalgamation of vampire mythology, sadly which the straight-to-video sequels never really elaborated on. It functions best in the lens of like an action-horror B-movie, a piece of pulp filmmaking that you really shouldn't take too seriously. Also, the reduced budget of the film, I think, definitely helped it achieve the rough-and-tumble, cheap Western feel it was going for. If it had a larger budget, I think it would have run the risk of looking maybe a little too slick as the case is with most modern Westerns. Yes, the film is predictable and over-the-top and has maybe just a tad too much bravado for its own good, but the film ultimately delivers on its basic promise. Vampires vs. James Woods, directed by John Carpenter. So go ahead and tell me your thoughts, guys, on John Carpenter's Vampires. When did you first get the chance to see the film, and do you think it still holds up today? 
Bonus question, would you be interested if John Carpenter and James Woods got back together to do an official sequel to the film? I mean, if Stallone can do Rambo 5, then we can pull James Woods out of his automatic adjustable recliner for just one more round of kick-ass. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, feel free to click like below. And if you want to see more videos just like this one, go ahead and click subscribe and ring the little bell thing, I guess. Did I give you wood? What? Huh? You get a little mahogany from that little ebony? Come on, tell the truth. <laughs>